benefit from the conversation. We're very lucky to have two um, diff really different um, uh, projects to, to hear from speakers, speakers from uh, Paul Mullis from the Arms House Association and Chris Coates from uh, Lancaster experience with the co-housing project there and um, uh, currently involved in project managing the senior co-housing project. I'll let you do your own introductions properly. I've probably ha hashed that, but um, you can introduce yourselves when, when we're ready. One thing I just want to say uh, before we go is that this is a massive topic and we're not going to cover everything that um, you might be interested in today, but we would really, really like to start conversations uh, and inspire people to think um, differently about um, the way they um, um, carry on conversations or the op just, just explore the options that may be available to us where we live. Um, when thinking about uh, how, how housing is working for, for older people, older residents. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we really can't, couldn't possibly cover the whole range of things that impinge on life as we get older, because that includes an awful lot of um, changing circumstances in terms of independence and uh, potentially care, um, healthcare requirements and so on. We probably won't get deeply into that today. Those are things that um, uh, both Chris and Paul will have a view on and may share some information on, but I think really we're talking about models for people to um, benefit from um, a, a community approach to um, how they live in later life. So that said, I don't want to stifle any conversation or debate. And what we're going to do while we're listening to the presentations is use the chat function to raise any questions at all, specifically questions, ideally, that Paul and Chris and myself and anybody else in the room may be able to answer. Um, but um, if there are conversations that we don't get to today, then let's try and find a way of following up on them later on. And uh, I'm, I'm really up for that. So. So please don't feel limited by what we're talking about um, directly today. And let's, uh, let's just think of this as the beginning of a, a longer conversation. That would be great. So I think I've said everything I want to say at the outset. Um, uh, yeah, specifically, I think the issues we hear about with, um, within the context of older people and housing is um, about how the market sometimes doesn't work for them and maybe uh, issues of downsizing um, and th there's, a, there's a kind of economic conversation to be had. But I think also, and we'll probably hear a fair amount about this, there's a social aspect to it, which sometimes gets, um, gets a bit lost. It's coming to the fore, I, I would say, in conversations that we're hearing through the pandemic um, and the highlighting of isolation and loneliness that people are experience in these rather peculiar circumstances we find ourselves in. But I think there's a theme there that um, is, is worth exploring as people become um, potentially more isolated as they get older. So um, I, those, are the, those are the sort of starting points for me. And I will hand over to Paul, who will introduce himself beautifully and um, tell us all about how arms houses are, are working with um, uh, people in the northeast from his perspective. Okay, thanks, Paul. Hopefully, you've got that screen share. Is that, is that That's looking case? good. Yeah, great. Um, yes, um, Arms Houses. Well, just to introduce myself first, I'm the Chief Executive of Durham Age My Workers Homes Association, which is a long title for a small organization. Um, we focus, obviously, as you get from that title in the northeast of England, but my daughter, actually interesting, my daughter is, or maybe not so interestingly, but relevant anyway, and my daughter is at University of Lancaster. Um, and so for the last three years, I've become more familiar with uh, the idiosyncrasies of that, that lovely city. And, and it has much in common, common actually, with Durham. Uh, Durham is a city, there's student housing, there's a lack of local job opportunities, there's old stock, planning issues in a, you know, an old city. Um, so talking about arms houses and our experience over here in the northeast, I do think there's actually there's more in common to have with the north parts of the northwest anyway than uh, than uh, you perhaps imagine at first uh, first glance. The Pennines aren't that much of a barrier really. Um, so I'm talking about arms houses. 
uh, which is a, a name that some may have heard of, some may not. You may have a, a view about what an arms house is, um, but uh, we'll come to that. Um, it's a model that, that's been around for older people's housing for mm, about a thousand years. Um, it predates the Norman Conquest. Um, and Dharma ourselves, we've, we've been around 122 years now. We were founded in, well, 123, we were founded in 1898 um, in the, uh, out of the problems that arose from the mining industry. And older people would, uh, when they retired, they'd be kicked out of their tight house and end up in the workhouse and the marriage would be split. And people thought that was a horrible thing and a terrible thing. So our ancestors were created to solve that problem. And obviously arms houses have cropped up around the country as different problems arise, primarily working with older people, but um, often not, often working with key workers, as we call them now, or, or families working in, in farming industries or you know, where people have difficulty getting access to good quality housing that's appropriate for them. And, is, and it's a way of delivering it in a way that's, been, that's sensitive to the local communities, that's generated by the local communities um, and has been, as I say, for, for centuries. Um, so what is Dharma? Come on, advance to the next slide. There we go. Uh, as I said, we're the largest arms house charity in the UK. We've got about 70, over 1,700 homes in a group of linked charities. In, we operate in 150 sites across all the local authorities in what was the Durham Coalfield. Uh, and we manage another 39, 40 homes on behalf of some other small arms house charities that are still independent, but still have their own sets of trustees. Um, we're still uh, continuing to provide new modern uh, two, built, two bedroom bespoke um, bungalows across the region. By the end of this financial year that we've, uh, that's coming up, we'll have built something like 100 new bungalows uh, over the last three years. Um, we've had quite a bit of a, a little spate of, of, of opportunity. Um, as I said, we've built something like 500 over the last um, ooh, maybe 15, 20 years or so, um, new bungalows. So that's, uh, we're still plowing ahead. Arms houses aren't dead by any means. It's a, a, a vibrant, vibrant model. Um, but one of the questions that I was asked by Fran to talk about was how we develop new homes um, for our communities. Um, and what, what's our experience in that regard? And one of the, um, it's not rocket science, I'd say, it just needs three key ingredients, um, land, money, and the contacts that are needed to make those, bring those things together. And then one key, key contact that you can't really quantify is good luck. You just need to be in the right place at the right time sometimes for those to come together. But, you know, you can make your own luck. So um, it's, not all, uh, it's, uh, it's not all just random. Uh, our model, really, at the way we make that happen for us, uh, we've got a strong brand. As I said, we've been around for 122 years, 123 years. People know us, people trust us, people see what we do and have a good experience of living there. And that, you know, the local community know what, what, what's on offer. And we have a waiting list. We've got, as I say, about 1,800 properties. We've got a waiting list of over 2,500 people on it. Um, and that's not including people on the council uh, waiting list or, that also have access. Um, so getting the local, that, that brand gets the local authority, local MPs, local communities on side. Um, people always welcome our new developments. You know, when the Dharma logo goes up on the board, we don't seem to get much objection. Um, and, but then, it, you know, we need to have boots on the ground. We've got a good development partnership with a regional, a large housing association, which is called Carbon Homes. That works, it's becoming a national organisation. They're very ambitious, but they provide uh, a way into Homes England grants for us. Um, and then we've also got a, a partnership with a local developer in the Esh Group, and they often come to us where there are opportunities that they think would work with our kind of what we can offer in Section 106 schemes and similar opportunities as well. Um, as I said, money, it costs around £150,000 give or take, obviously varies a little bit from site to site to build a two-bedroom bungalow. And typically, that's the kind of stuff we're looking at, that would be 25,000 for the land and the rest would be build cost and obviously overhead. Um, sometimes the land comes free. Sometimes it can cost more than 25,000. It could be up to 30, 35,000 sometimes, if, but if it's a really desirable site. But that's the kind of ballpark we operate in. And we fund that 
Again, as I say, we have access to Homes England Grant. We're a registered provider and we work with um, uh, relevant partners that can access that grant with us. Um, Homes England Grant can come in something like 30, 32,000 pound a unit at the minute. Obviously that fluctuates depending on the flavor of the government and the, their attitude to older people's housing and so on. But typically that's the kind of money we're looking at. Which, and the balance comes, comes in in the form of loans and when you put that all into the sausage machine, that comes out at a rent of around £100 a week, which is about 80% of market rent, as it's the affordable rent under the government's guidelines, um, which is all eligible for housing benefits. So anyone with low income that couldn't afford that from their own reserves um, can obviously access housing benefits if they need to and get that fully um, eligible. Um, so what is an arms house? Again, I've got a little game. I mean, you know, I'm not going to ask for... Um, uh, you to to to, to um, there's no stakes here, but just if anyone's got an idea, can you spot the arms house amongst all of these properties that are have been out and about in the northeast? Uh, just uh, if anyone wants to put a guess in the chat, I'll leave it. For, I'll give you thirty seconds to put something in the chat just to say which one you think is uh, the arms house. I, I, I should do the. I should have got the, the countdown there. Do 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 do. Shouldn't I? <laughs> Great. Five seconds. Three, two, one. Great. Right. So I see, I've got some guesses here. There's a few clumpy for F. B looks unlikely. A E. Well, two of two have found me out. It was a trick question. All of them are in fact arms houses. They're all properties that are actually Durham Age Mine Workers properties. Um, and some are new built, some we've acquired, some have we manage on behalf of other people, some have just been, one is a sheltered scheme, but they're all actually arms houses. Um, and I just put that point up there just to say that, um, what is an arms house? An arms house is actually quite a broad definition. We've got a legal definition of what an arms house is, but it's pretty broad. And that, you know, we have our preconceptions. We imagine people in perhaps funny clothes praying for the, 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 the soul of some long de deceased knight of the realm or you know, things like the Chelsea pensioners or whatever. But actually, that's part of the story. Yes, those organizations exist, but the vast majority are quite different. And you probably wouldn't notice them if you're working, walking past them. The definition is just as it says there on the tin. This is the legal definition. So it's a bit wordy and a bit. Um, bit boring, but it, it just really, it's about a unit of residential accommodation that's owned by a charity for a charitable purpose. Um, and the one key difference, difference from another rented property that it's occupied under a license to occupy rather than a tenancy agreement. They're broadly similar, they perform the same function, but actually the license gives the property owner, the charity, a little bit more control over who comes in, who goes out, and what the people might do while they're in there, not to control them, but to protect the community. Um, so if someone's, um, you know, keep, keep someone who's living there who perhaps isn't fitting in with the community and being antisocial for some, you know, some reason, it just gives the charity a little bit more opportunity to say, hang on, that's not working. We need to do something else. Um, as I said, it's the charity, the definition goes on a bit. And it uh, goes on a bit more. But again, there's key, key items about the relief of financial hardship. Um, and it's, it's clearly a charity. It's not there about making a profit. It's there about the good of the community. It's, a, it's own, owning a community asset um, and a housing in particular. And again, there are some key things that identify arms houses, but they're not necess necessary. They're just sort of the kind of things that arms houses are de dealing with. Sometimes you've got a, a gift that set it up. It's always about the relief of poverty. Um, and it's about a community. Um, and it's about a particular problem that the community is identified in a geographical area. So they say, well, look, these people have priority for access to that kind of housing because it's hard for them to get housing otherwise. So maybe they're retired. They've been kicked out of tight housing, as was the case 122 years ago. Though, but it may be. Key, key workers whose salaries perhaps aren't enough because house prices are very high locally or 
retired people again because there just aren't enough bungalows being built in the in the country generally and they need that kind of housing the private sector won't bring, build them um, whatever it may be but the real thing is it, arms houses are about the people it's as i said it's about local communities um, providing for local people um, to provide a, a, an affordable a decent home operating a community within a community people in that arms house community it's, it's usually focused around, look, these are neighbours who work together, have something in common, opportunity to build friendships, informal support, ties that bind, that kind of thing. Um, the, the kind of thing that gets eroded in, in communities because of modern living so often. Why would you want to be an arms house charity? As I said, it's proven. It's, it's a model that's been around a thousand years and shows no sign of going away. Um, it's working well now, community focused. Um, it's understood by the Charity Commission and the Ministry um, for Communities and Housing and Local Government. Um, and I say it, it, it provides a way of protecting the asset for the long term benefit of the local community. So we've been exempt for some initiatives such as Right to Buy. I mean, the longest arms house charity that we know of in this country is still going after 700 years and it's still doing a good job. It's adaptable, it's got a wide definition. And above all, I would say you're not alone, you're not reinventing the wheel with an arms house there's there's um you know a lot of ground has been tread trod beforehand so we've got the arms house association um which not all arms houses are members of the arms house association but i would say all arms house association members are arms houses um, it's a trade body um and it's able to provide support information guidance on quite a range of issues i quote took this quote off their website and at the minute there are 1600 arms house charities and they provide homes to around 35,000 residents around the country. So it's not a small, minor, you know, it's, a, it's not an um, insignificant undertaking. 35,000 residents would be quite a significant size of a housing association. Um, so it, it's, um, you're not alone if you're trying to, you know, you're not trying to forge your own furrow, plow your own furrow. Um, slide, very good, oops, covered. Yeah, so. So the Arms House Association say they've got a website, this is just a snapshot of their website, um, but they provide a lot of advice. They provide good standards of Arms House management, um, which, you know, uh, um, good, um, good um, standards of service provision. They give an exemplar. They, they're not there as policemen, they're there to provide advice and help. And if trustees have questions, don't know how to do something, they're, they're always on the end of the phone or an email or there's forums to chat with other arms house members and, and, and provide events, provide a wonderful uh, magazine, the Arms House Gazette, which has always got key current issues in there. I'm, I'm tr it sounds like a hard sell. I'm not, it's not a hard sell. It's, it, it's, it's, it's very cheap to be a member of the Arms I think it's only a couple hundred quid, which for a trade membership body is, is not very much. If you compare it, we pay about eight and a half grand to be part of the National Housing Federation, for instance. We pay nowhere near that to be part of the Arms House Association, and I use them a lot more. Um, they've got good contacts within the Charity Commission. Charity Commission actually rely on them in a lot of ways just to be their eyes and ears and to implement things, um, you know, good, good practice. Um, they lobby with government. Um, uh, they make the case for Arms House um, getting appropriate treatment within legislation and not just ignored or sidelined or disadvantaged. There was a recent debate in the House of Lords just a few weeks ago uh, about the, 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 how good arms house housing was, was the conclusion in a nutshell. Um, and it generally increases the arms house profile across the country that are there, trying to plug this as a good way of providing good housing. So plugging into that is helpful for any organisation providing this kind of something that would be appropriate. So that's it in a nutshell. I was, I was only given a few minutes, so I've tried to whiz through. I'm sure there may be lots I could have said that I haven't said, um, and maybe you have lots of questions. So do, um, do um, say. So we've got a, a question popped up. So Fran, if you're happy, I'm quite happy to answer questions. Absolutely, yeah. Do you want to take yourself off screen share so yeah, we can I'll see like you better? That. There we go. Thank you. Ah. That was lovely. That was that was a really good whistle stop tour. And I think, you know, most of us will have learned something we didn't know before about arms houses. But yes, Chris has chipped in with a, a good question about the miners connection at the moment. And just, um, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, obviously, I'm often asked about that. And we had a debate. Do we take the word miners out of our name? Um, we felt not. Uh, we, 
the mining, the last mine closed in the coal field in 1999. Um, we have serving, you know, people who went down the pits who are younger than I am, still in their 40s. Um, we provide housing for people 50 plus. So um, you don't have to be very aged. You don't have to be a miner to access the property. Um, what The way we operate a waiting list, um, it's advantageous if you've got mining crew, you get extra bonus points on, and you know, you, you, you get to leap, leapfrog. On, on the waiting list if you've got mining background. But if you haven't got mining background and you're still someone in housing need in, in the age category, you can go on the waiting list and you can have access to the property anyway. As I say, we get a lot of Homes England funding and part of the condition of when we decided to become a housing association was where we can't, you know, to ask the question about the relevance of our benefit. They weren't forcing us to change our beneficiary class, but they were saying, look, have a think about it. Is it, you know, we want to be as inclusive as possible as it's public money. And we had a good think about it. And obviously knowing that writing was on the wall for mining, we had that um, discussion and, 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 you know, and that's where we're at, which works well and it can, it'll stay there. But as I said, there's still plenty of mine workers around. About 40% of our residents have a mining connection, either they themselves or their spouse went down the pits or worked in related industry. We have two former mine workers on the board, one who went down the pits, one who worked in an, an assistant eight, and they're not that much older than I am. So, you know, it's still relevant, but obviously it's, you know, as the pits have closed, it will cease to be so relevant and just be heritage really. I can see that Becky's got her hand up. Are you wanting to chip in, Becky? Yeah, I have a question. Sorry, I thought it'd be, it's a bit long. Um, if we see random almshouses around towns and villages, are they all still likely to be almshouses or have some been lost over time? And also, if, if they are still an almshouse, how do you find out how to access those particular ones? Um, if they are, if they, should, if they are an arms house charity, we register with the charity commission. Um, now, finding out the name, one would hope. Sometimes it can, that can be a problem. You know, there's an old building. It may have ceased to, you know, may have been sold into the private sector because it's no longer possible to, you know, it's no longer suitable for, for older people. For instance, it may have stone floors or, you know, goodness knows if it's that old. Um, so not all buildings that look like an arms house will still be an arms house, many will. Um, hopefully if they're a well-run charity, they'll, you know, they'll at least have a plaque up somewhere or a notice saying this is such and such a charity and you can go and find out about them. Not, not all charities are well-run somehow, you know, and that's an onward battle with the Arms House Association trying to encourage people to modernize and be outward looking and actually provide a service. Some have trustees have been there for 50 years and they're, they're, they're you know, they're, they're, they're left and they're not sure what they're doing and that kind of thing so but if it's a well-run charity you should be able to find out um land registry again is a way of finding out who owns a particular property um ringing up the arms house association you know going on the arms house association website and saying there's such and such a property are they an arms house that you're aware of would be another way of, of finding out they would they will know uh, probably who that is if it is an arms house I don't know if you know if you have a particular property in, that you're aware of. I could do a bit of research for. <laughs> you just you just see them, don't you? And you yeah. think, oh, that's that's arms houses, and you know you're never really sure. And so yeah, yeah it would be interesting to know. Yeah. No, that's it. I mean, that is an ongoing problem that sometimes get a little bit insular. That they're, they're not, you know, the lay people on the board who aren't really, um, you know, they're just trying to keep things ticking over. They, you know, they will perhaps advertise as well as they could do. You know, you, you do get that. Um, that's true. Okay, well, I think we'll just keep moving on. Thank you very yeah. much, Paul. We'll come back with some more questions and, yeah. uh, you know, we can all chip into the discussion later. I've got, I've got something I'm wanting to ask, but I think I'd like it to come up later. And it's about how um, your local um, properties or the groups of properties, how they do liaison with their residents or if, yeah. if they're made up of their residents in some way that you describe yeah. as the communities within the communities. And yeah. if we could talk about that later, yeah, that would be um, really helpful because um, it feels a bit, uh, you, you're talking from uh, uh, the perspective of an organization that provides a lot of housing for yeah, yeah. quite a large number of people and they aren't all one community. That, that's, yeah. that's an interesting sort of filter down of uh, how we, how we um, make people feel engaged in the, the yeah. conversation about where they Absolutely. live. So if you're happy to dwell on that for a minute, we'll let Chris in to talk yeah. about um, what's going on in Lancaster. And I think we'll all hear something different and new and we'll see some lovely pictures as well, which is great. So over to you, Chris, thank you. Um, am I, can I share my screen? I've... 
you can. Okay, great. I won't do that. I'll do a bit of intro first. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, uh, as I said, if, if you were here at the beginning, I'm I'm Chris Coates. I'm one of the. Um, I now describe myself as a former founder member of Forge Bank Co Housing on the basis that I'm not founding anything anymore. Um, I mean, my background. I I go. I end up describing myself in terms of community-led housing as, as the sort of ultimate poacher turned gamekeeper in that I started off as a homeless squatter in, in London and I'm now basically a, a, sort, of, um, a sort of property developer. And uh, so I've, I've, I've done the whole lot. And in between, I spent 20 years renting in a housing co-op, small housing cooperative in East Lancashire. Um, and my, as I said, my background is a, a carpenter in the construction industry, moved into site management and project management and did a lot of work in the, the 90s and the, the noughties working for voluntary um, sector and uh, quite a lot of arts organizations who were getting lottery money and acting as a sort of go-between between, between uh, voluntary groups and the construction industry, um, neither of which seemed to understand each other. Um, lo lots, of, lots of site managers going, what do you mean I have to go to a committee meeting um, and things like that. So, um, yeah, in um, in sort of about 2012, we moved into this project, Lancaster Co-Housing, that I'm going to show you some uh, pictures of later. And after, sort of after we'd moved in, somebody asked me the question, well, would you do it again? Um, and I, I, yeah, I don't regret having said what I said then, but I said, I don't, I don't really want to go to Leeds or Sheffield or Manchester and, and do it. But if it was next door, um, I might consider it. And then a site. So there's what has developed into Holton Senior Co-Housing Project is on a site literally next door to the one um, that Forge Bank Co-Housing developed. Um, and it's part of a, I mean, Paul saying that it, it, some of this, some of it is luck. Um, it's part of a development that went bankrupt in the in the housing crash in 2008. It's part of a bigger development site um, that was half, yeah, I would say about halfway through being built, and the the developer went bankrupt, and we we bought part of it and. The senior co-housing um, site is sort of the last bit of a, a much wider development site. Um, and somebody came and asked me, you know, you said if it was next door, you'd do it again. Um, well, we'd like to see if we can get a project off the ground. The, the site had planning permission for a small nursing home, um, which turned out not to be commercially viable at all. Um, we do know that uh, at least a couple of um, firms that run nursing homes did look at the site and, and basically said it's not big enough, um, not for a new build um, for the figures to stack up. Um, so it was sitting there um, and we decided to approach both the owner and the council as a sort of um, dip our toes in just to see whether they would be open to, to, to the suggestion that just shifting things slightly to a senior co-housing project, which is a fairly standard model for co-housing in Europe and, and sort of North America. Um, but there is only one currently um, senior co-housing project in in the UK, which is um, down in Barnet, um, which was known as the Older Women's um, Co-Housing Project. Um, and they took 18 years to, to get on site and built. Um, and uh, that's largely to do with, the, with factors to do with London housing. But in some ways, the Holton 